Ooh, we had some internet trouble there. Wow. Um, you know, let me let me make sure that my uh, this camera is actually at the appropriate angle here. Pretty much. Pretty much. I was like in the process of setting things up, and then I realized that the uh, the internet had sort of ceased to function um, in real time. Let me actually make sure that you can actually hear the drums and everything. Okay. All is all is well. Um, and here's what we're immediately gonna do. We're immediately going to cut to messing with the webcam properties. <laughs> that is what we're immediately gonna just destroy. Uh, whoa, well, no. <laughs> Not good. Not good, oh, that's so dark. Why is that so dark? Yeah, let's go with that. Then let's go for Whoa, whoa, look at how red I can get. That's so funny. Wait a second. Okay. Lovely. Make some Whoa, Jesus. Really just warping through time here. Okay. Just go with this. Very bizarre. Very bizarre. It's like the wind picks up around here and the internet goes down. Um Okay. Well, I just want to, I want to, I think the first thing I want to talk about is something completely unrelated to anything at all having to do with the stream uh, whatsoever, which is um, uh, House of the Dragon. <laughs> because we were just watching it before I came in here and now it's like on my mind and it's all I can think about. Has anyone noticed with this show that like, you know, the, the episodes are still, we're still in this universe where every show is for some reason over an hour long. You know, every episode is like practically the length of a feature film from the 1980s. And uh, for some reason, you know, there's not actually an hour of like material. So what you end up with a lot of is a lot of sequences of people walking down a corridor at sort of a leisurely pace thinking about something out loud or two people having a conversation where no new information is being offered, but rather um, they're talking about how they feel and this will go on for three minutes and you can almost see in the writer's room that they're like, okay, that's like, that's like five pages of the script. That'll kill a couple of minutes. Here, let's go to the next thing. Let's go to the next thing. It's like, it's just so crazy how the length of these shows is now so inflated. And this is, you know, we haven't even finished this most recent episode, but as you can tell by the fact that we're like days and days, like four or five days late to the party on this episode, we've like simply stopped caring. Um... And why? Because there's, there's a really great miniseries in here. There's a really great five-episode miniseries. But basically, we're getting like a 10 or 11-episode series, right? Like half the length of it is just like padding, you know? <laughs> you know? So it's like, you know, there's a great show in there, but I think we're sort of like we've lost our motivation to like keep absolutely up to date with it. About what um, House of the Dragon. House of the Dragons. So we've been like keeping up to date with House of the Dragon is what is what I was saying, except for this most recent episode, which we have simply just like forgotten to watch. And it's not even because we really super disliked the episode in real time or anything like that. Um, it was just sort of like, you know, some of the episodes have been really great and then some of the episodes have left like very little impact. And then the episodes that leave very little impact, it's like... We, we're then like thinking about them the next day and then we're like wait a minute <laughs> wait a minute some of this just like sucks or like is stupid you know there's all these characters in this show that are doing like 
something that none of the original Game of Thrones characters would be caught dead doing, which is like we literally get sequences now in every episode for probably the past four or five episodes where someone literally explains their evil plot to the person that they are trying to trick. And, and I don't know what this is. I guess this is just for, like, people in the cheap seats or something like that. I don't know. It's like, I mean, this is part of the thing that I've kind of forgotten is that, like, it was the first show that I think a lot of, like, kind of normie Americans watched that had these sort of, like, themes of, like, old world palace intrigue politics and stuff like that, right? Like, you're talking about an audience of people who maybe isn't used to... Uh, this kind of fiction or something like that, or, or also like they've never, you know, they're like the person who's watching it is sort of like the typical American, right? So like they've never cracked a history book, right? And so basically you end up with a situation where like all of this is like expositional dialogue, but they end up talking in a way that no one who is supposedly such a strategic mastermind would ever speak. And that's really all over this show. It really wasn't so much in the original series. Um, but we keep getting these sequences in which it's like, in which it's like, you know, uh, my, my brother would want the true blood to be on the throne and you are his wife and I am his brother. Therefore, I am closer to the true blood than you are. Therefore, I should have the throne, but you currently have the throne. So I need to devise a plan to get on the throne. And, and like, this guy is like telling this to this person. It's just like... Way to telegraph what you're doing. I don't know. Uh, I'm just completely unrelated, but just, uh, you know, as I was sitting here, like, waiting for the internet problem to fix itself, I was just, like, thinking about this, the problems with this show. And you're like, oh, tell me more. Yeah, you know, it's like, I feel like half of every episode is wasted on basically exposition dialogue and people pacing around and muttering to themselves. It's like these episodes could be the the tightest 35 minutes of television you've ever seen. But no, it needs to be an hour long episode. It's just so it's just so it's just so strange. Um okay. What am I doing? I guess I'm doing I guess I'm doing uh it's 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 that time of year again for heavy metal music. This really is the optimal time of year. Uh, for most genres of metal, you know, mostly black metal is the one that people sort of think of more frequently than not, but it's, uh, it's really pretty much all around. I mean, maybe not, um, maybe not like thrash, you know, like thrash metal music, you know, old, old Metallica, old Anthrax, stuff like that. Probably, probably not that kind of music. But for most of the sort of, like, kind of, you know, extreme stuff, this is really the time of year to listen to this. So this is, I think today is an attempt to have a sort of seasonally appropriate uh, metal music. I actually, like, want to put on, uh, <laughs> let me put on my Uggs. Um, I, uh, I've attempted to curate uh, a greater number of songs than, than normal because... Um, I, uh, I want to change the schedule of this because this turns out to be on like a very strange day, but there's sort of a natural break in the scheduling coming up. So I'm going to stick it out for like another two weeks before I switch around the day of the week that I play this. So I like struggled to come up with some ideas. So I was, so I was trying to make up for that with a volume of songs. Cause you know, I have like a YouTube video that I want to talk about, which I, I have a feeling we'll probably end up talking about today. It's kind of unrelated to everything we've been discussing, though. Um, so I figured to make up for the sort of lack of th thematic educational content in terms of talking or whatever, I would just try to make up for it in the, uh, in the set list of the day. Um, and I planned on just like kicking right into it or something, but then we had these, those internet problems and I started thinking about House of the Dragon. Uh, I just got sidetracked in my in my own brain, but um, I actually did get to appropriately warm up today, so I think I'm gonna maybe play solo for a little bit here, and then uh, kick into 
kick into some actual songs. Um, partially, I would like to play solo just to make sure that all of the tech is actually working since I, I didn't uh, get to uh, mess with that stuff as much as I normally do. I think it I think it should all be good, but you know, just so that I can see the camera angle and stuff like that. So I'm gonna play solo for a little bit, just see just see what happens. And uh, we, we will uh, move forward from there. That angle's pretty good, I guess. Eh, we'll see, we'll see.
<sighs> cool. <laughs> I, uh, I've been very, very, very gradually trying to add into improvised phrases things out of this book. If I can pull it here. Out of this book, and then I actually don't have a, a paper version of this, but another textbook on, on Afro-Cuban rhythms. And uh, I've realized that, like, you know, particularly when you play, you know, a lot of music in sort of popular genres, anything from, like, super mainstream pop all the way to, like, heavy, heavy, heavy metal, you know, um, you basically end up usually pulling from sort of uh, the sort of minimum usable set of, of rhythms, essentially. Um, and I realized that part of the way out of that sort of uh, uh, self-made trap um, that a lot of people get into is literally just like, yeah, go find, like, the percussion-based folk music of basically, like, any group of people, and you will immediately see, like, a dozen really interesting ideas. So I think um, the main things, I believe, are uh, um, the Mozambique, which I know is was sort of a favorite of, uh, of Steve Gadd for a very long time. Um, in terms of incorporating the basic Mozambique rhythm into uh, into more conventional drum beats. And then I'm also trying to play around with the cascara, um, which I can never I can never quite remember where the accents are landing on the cascara, but I think it's something like this. Something like that. Uh, I can't. I can't quite remember where uh, where the groups of one and the groups of two are in the cascara because there's something about it that feels kind of alien to me. The Mozambique, I'm pretty sure, is much easier. I think the Mozambique is simply this. You can see that that one immediately sort of like gels with me a little better. And I can also see why it gel, gels so well with Steve Gadd is because there's a, a kind of phrase within the Mozambique as a meter that um, sort of matches something that you already play a lot um, in, in a lot of sort of like Western pop drum beats and stuff like that. Um, which is essentially um, essentially a sort of modification of the paradiddle. Um, so if you turn the paradiddle into a drum beat, basically with like very basic kick drum underneath, you can easily turn it into like a two and four rock beat, which is just like this. It's almost like an immigrant song or something, you know, it's just, uh, as long as you just accent the, the, the two and the four, basically, you end up with kind of a, a conventional drum beat. Um, and the Mozambique weirdly kind of like lines up with one of the common variations on the paradiddle as drum beat concept, um, which is basically that you just stick, you stick an extra note on your, uh, on your dominant hand, um, 
So rather than playing an even number of notes on both hands, you have kind of one extra on your hand that's playing usually a cymbal. So I'll play uh, I'll play I'll play four measures of just the the basic paradiddle beat, and then I'll show you the very common variation that's used. That's essentially the pattern you end up with on the one hand. And uh, the Mozambique kind of almost by accident like lines up with that pattern, just by the way that the rest of the measure of, of a Mozambique phrase kind of works out. And so it, it ends up like fitting very naturally into like a nice even two and four based, you know, Western style drum beat. Um, and it, and it converts into that kind of mode pretty, pretty easily. But those are just like simple ways to like make your playing so much more tasteful because, um, you know, I think the problem with a lot of the way that sort of people learn a lot of rock music and a lot of sort of modern popular music is they don't necessarily memorize specific like rhythmic concepts really. It, it's not that there's not there's not ideas at play or that people's heads aren't exactly in the right space. It's like people are memorizing sort of ideas on the drums. Uh, they're memorizing sort of rhythmic phrases and stuff like that. But the phrases tend to be sort of like weird, almost sort of like mathematical concept. And you know, we were we were talking about Meshuga a ton last week. Maybe this is a little bit of like the Meshugification of all music or something like that. But it's a lot of stuff where it's like you'll learn a polyrhythm, right? And the idea is that then like you'll basically work the polyrhythm just across every potential permutation. So it's like you want to learn like a three over two or like a four over three polyrhythm. You know, you basically learn, you know, you just learn to play that on all of the different places where it could basically start on a measure. But of course, the point of a polyrhythm is that basically it's like, your limbs are kind of always doing the same thing. So like, you know, you know, <laughs> it, the simplest version of like a heavy metal polyrhythm, right? Uh, let's say, you know, the, the feet are going to be doing double bass as 16th notes and then quarter notes on the snare. And then let's say the ride cymbal will be, will be uh, you know, a three or a four over three polyrhythm. It will add a four over three polyrhythm because, or a three over two, I guess it would be. Um, which is that it would actually fit as a measure of six, eight evenly across the bar line. But um, because this is going in basically 
units of three bass drum notes um, instead of four, it, it doesn't line up evenly with the measures, basically. So this sounds overly complicated and weird, but I'll go from playing just like um, something that matches um, the, the, the length of the phrase on the ride cymbal, and then I'll go to playing the polyrhythm that I'm talking about, and you'll probably hear what I mean. So if you notice, basically, um, the frequency with which that second one is being hit is actually frequent enough that if you basically switched everything and kept the same pace at the double bass, just kept this going, basically you would end up um, with uh, a drum beat in swing time or 6-8 rather than in straight time. So that's essentially a polyrhythm. You're playing sort of like combinations of like a strong a swung pattern against a straight pattern or something, uh, and then it gets more complicated from there when you get into like you know fives and sevens and elevens and stuff like that, right? But that's a very simple example of a polyrhythm. You you'll see what uh, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll transition into a sort of six eight type thing rather than a four four type thing, and you'll see what I mean that 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 second pattern fits with um, something that's in triplets more than it does something that's in four. So that's basically just just switching up, you know, the snare and stuff like that to basically accommodate for whether or not this is going one two three four one two three four one two three four or if it's going one two three one two three one two three, you know, and and so that's you know the the most basic polyrhythm. But the problem is that basically, you know, that's that's such a popular polyrhythm because it's it's very sort of musically useful you can sort of get the feeling of that in your body pretty easily as a player. What becomes like less useful is as the polyrhythms get sort of more and more ornate and more and more difficult. You know, like the meme from a couple of years ago was, uh, you know, you know, the kid uh, brought a practice pad into a 7-Eleven and he played a 7 over 11 polyrhythm inside of the 7-Eleven at 7-11 p.m. <laughs> right, and if I remember correctly, you know the the seven over eleven polyrhythm is some insanely unmusical kind of plonky, plinky, ploinky sounding thing like this. I mean, maybe that would be useful to like Danny Carey in a Tool song or something like that. I could see someone maybe making something super musical out of that. But but you can kind of see it if you sort of, for instance, just look at the arms and separate them out. It's like, what's going on? Is that basically you sort of lock into something with one arm. And then you lock into something sort of slightly different and off kilter on the other arm. Right? And then basically you sort of... Um, you just sort of dig into this pattern for a period of four measures, let's say, or eight measures or 16 measures, and you sit in this pattern and you lock in it. You know, let's even say like, you know, uh, 
the way the tool would probably play that seven over 11 polyrhythm would probably be something like that, where you simply sort of lock into that pattern and stay there. You know, where it's like, that's that's a lot of the applications. I, I don't know what the hell I just played, by the way. I just <laughs> I just decided to, like, riff on that idea of the 7 over 11 polyrhythm as if it was a Tool song. Um, and that kind of felt like the type of build that would be on an old Tool album or something like that. Um, but, you know, that's the way that a lot of people sort of learn approaches to sort of interesting rhythmic ideas, where it's like, basically, you set these two math equations against one another, Right? And what I, what I find interesting, particularly about sort of like um, a lot of the sort of like Latin rhythms that you can kind of like teach yourself how to play if you, similar to jazz, you have to really sort of bathe in that world in order to make it sound good. And I'm not at the point where I've played enough of it that I can really make it sound brilliantly good, but I can kind of learn the rhythms and start to develop the dexterity to make them sound better, you know? What I like about the, the Latin rhythms and what I like about a lot of Afro-Cuban rhythms and what I like about a lot of straight-up African rhythms is the fact that they are actually music. They are made to be patterns. Um, they do not necessarily follow like a mathematical constant. They are instead a sort of musical phrase that sounds a certain way. It sounds energetic. It sounds chaotic. It sounds danceable it sounds romantic it sounds whatever right even like you know bossa nova or something like that it's like very slow music but the there's a feel to it and it's a very particular feel You know, it's like, it's not music that's designed to get your heart rate up or whatever, you know, it's kind of like slow romantic music or whatever, but it's actually like kind of an interesting folk way. It's an interesting kind of style, you know, and then of course they have all of these other folk ways that are much more sort of, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of a boring example, bossa nova, you know, but, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, there's a lot more to Latin music than just like girl, girl from Ipanema or whatever, you know what I mean? There's also just like the most blazing, you know, samba, jazz, like, You know, where you just take like the samba rhythm.
you know, and variations on the samba rhythm, and you just bring it up to like total light speed. Um, you know, there's like there's like all sorts of, and and of course, like imagine that being played, but like by someone who actually knows what they're doing. You know what I mean? Someone who's like really kind of familiar with these rhythms and and is keeping time. And you know, the idea of uh, of um, you know the clave in Latin music and in Latin music in all sorts of different Latin musics, you know, the idea of the clave as an ostinato is really interesting. It's almost like, you know, the revolution that Bach had, right, in some ways was the singing bass line. The fact that his bass line was not simply the bass notes of a chordal structure that you needed to have in order to make the music make sense, but it was actually a part that itself had a melody and that you could sing and had a lyrical quality to it and that it was a musical quality in and of itself rather than just a basis of chords for the treble clef stuff to sit over top of and do whatever it wanted. You know, Bach's revolution was that that lower register was actually doing something musical. You know, the clave in like Latin music is like the same thing. It's like, yeah, it's an ostinato, but like it's not like how I think we tend to treat our hi hat foot as drummers, which is that we're playing our stuff we actually care about, and then we've been told that you know Vinnie Colaiuta and uh, and you know uh, uh, you know um, I don't know Tony Williams. Um, did this on eighth notes. So it's very important that we do that on eighth notes. So we play whatever we want over top of it, and then we're just like chicking away on this, and we hope to God it's in time. You know, it's like kind of everyone learns to do that eventually because you're told that you should have enough limb independence that you can do that with the hi-hat, you know? But it's like that's really not the purpose of like a clave. Like imagine how much harder it is to instead of just mindlessly chicking away at this to have it be a pattern like, you know, one, two, three, four... You know, like something like just totally weird and, and alien in that way. And, and like, you know, Latin musicians like successfully converted those ideas to like the westernized drum kit in a way that I think is really fascinating. And these things are really not mathematical formulas. They're musical phrases, you know, and um, very few people like really take advantage of it. I mean, in some ways, I almost wish that someone would ask him this question directly but I have I fear that they don't because they fear that it may come off as almost sort of like a racist thing. But I wish that people asked Martin Lopez from, you know, uh, not the original drummer, but, you know, the the original great drummer in Opeth who was on all of their sort of classic period albums. You know, he and I think he and maybe both he and the bassist Martin Mendez both came from South America I know that Lopez has talked in interviews about how, like, he met the band members and he could only speak Swedish at, like, a second grade level. You know, he spoke, like, Spanish mostly. Like, like I don't think he was, like, necessarily born and raised in a community where he was, like, really well integrated into, like, European society. I'm pretty sure Mendez, the bassist, is from Paraguay? Uruguay? Something like that. And then Lopez, I can't remember kind of where he's originally from, but... Clearly, he grew up in, in like a Spanish-speaking household, probably listening to a lot of Spanish-language music and stuff like that. And, and as far as I can tell, he's actually one of the only examples, particularly in sort of like the metal world that I would say, of anyone who has adopted any of these ideas from like, you know, uh, other cultures' music and actually brought it in. And I, and I don't even know if he did it intentionally, but Lopez, all over Opeth's music, is this rhythm, this, this African, Afro-Cuban rhythm called the bembe, you know, which started as a purely African rhythm. I think it was like a Yoruba tribe rhythm, and then also got, like, imported into a lot of, of, of Afro-Cuban, like, dance music and stuff like that. 
And it's all over the place in Opeth, because, you know, Michael has a tendency to write songs in 12-8. And it just is this rhythm that fits, integrates so beautifully into some of these big atmospheric phrases of 12-8. And he plays kind of like a very metal version of it, where he often puts, uh, you know, the bass drum underneath every note on the cymbal but then also fills in the rest of it with ghost notes, you know? So it's actually still like very kind of Latin inspired and tastefully played. Like he's not playing like, you know, the little kid's version of this beat. He's playing it with the ghost notes fully integrated and everything. He's just playing like a very loud metal version, usually on like the bell of the ride cymbal. And, and this rhythm, this bembe rhythm is, is everywhere in Opeth's music. Uh, which is, you know, and of course, the, the thing there is that, you know, when you see a lot of people play Opeth music, this kind of proves my point in a way, because people have learned the closest version of the sort of mathematical formula that that rhythm could be represented with, which is the triple paradiddle, which is basically a note away from that. Uh, you, you know, it's like um, para, 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 diddle, para, 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 diddle, <laughs> right? <laughs> so they, they don't get that, um, basically skip beat into the next downbeat. That second to last note, dun, 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 dun. Um, they don't get that because they think it's a paradiddle diddle, which doesn't have that. But Lopez, you can hear him. He's not really, in most cases, when he's playing that rhythm, he's playing a bembe. He's not playing a triple paradiddle, you know? So, like, clearly he's heard this rhythm because he's playing that exact thing. And, you know, yeah, that's, like, something from, like, Afro-Cuban music and stuff like that. And, yeah, a lot, a lot of, you know, metal music, it's like, you know, we're comfortable with things landing on downbeats. We're comfortable with things landing on two and fours. We're comfortable with, you know, maybe ending a phrase and choking a symbol on, you know, the E and a, uh, you know, somewhere on an upbeat or someplace weird. And then beyond that, basically, you know, our vocabulary of rhythmic ideas is basically polyrhythms, depending on how technical the metal music is, you know, a good number of polyrhythms. And then basically all of the sort of uh, basic rhythmic phrases that are part of sort of the pop music lexicon. So basically it's like, you know, stuff you can play with single stroke rolls, double stroke rolls, paradiddles, uh, you know, <laughs> and then beyond that, it's just rhythms like, you know, the hemiola and stuff like that. You know, and you can play a lot of great metal music with just that basic vocabulary of rhythmic ideas, but I found that there's just like a total wellspring of stuff sitting out there, you know, particularly going under the name of like Latin music or, or oftentimes the horribly offensive term world music, right? Which is like this horrible, you know, politically correct construction that like doesn't even describe what it is really. Um, yeah, there's just like a wellspring of like more interesting stuff going on out there. You know, again, you think it's any coincidence why like one of the most creative metal players right now is Eloy? It's like, you know, you think a guy who's like, you know, from his childhood has been like bathing in these rhythms that we effectively don't hear, you know, in like in like public life in America. Of, of course, the, the rhythmic ideas that he comes with are going to be like so much more interesting and out there. Um... Anyway, yes. In honor of Halloween, could you discuss ghost notes and their usage? Yeah, yeah, let's let's do that. Maybe I'll play something. Maybe I'll play something with some weird ghost notes and then we can talk about it. Let me see. Do we have anything that's super heavy on the ghost notes? Hmm. Um Let me look at our playlist for the day here. Hmm. 
You know what? Yeah, actually, let's play a ghost note heavy Opeth thing now that we're also talking about Opeth. Yeah. Okay, we've played this we've played this once before, but it's worth playing again. I wanna I just kinda played it randomly and I really wanna kinda try to nail this one.
so that's uh that's an underrated Opeth song. That's a Leper Affinity uh, opener on Blackwater Park. Um, that's a uh, that's a song where um, the arrangement is complex enough that you can really see that there's a kind of prog influence and a more extreme metal influence kind of combining and then within the drum part itself you can also kind of hear that there's some kind of there's some weird sort of external um sort of alien uh, sourcing sourcing going on there for um where the rhythm rhythms are coming from um that might be a good way to transition into talking about ghost notes i mean you know Ghost Notes, I feel like I've had a very kind of bizarre journey with Ghost Notes because, you know, as a sort of precocious, you know, young person, when you first have access to this instrument, sorry, let me turn around here again, dealing with the chord situation. As a sort of like, you know, precocious young person who wants to play like, you know, the busiest parts imaginable, you know, ghost notes begin as like a very attractive prospect to you um, because the idea is essentially that you can play even like very basic, very simple beats and basically you can just fill them up with stuff, you know. So when you're a very elementary player, the idea, I think, if you're if you're someone who really like wants to learn quickly, you sometimes, like I did, end up actually having the opposite problem that a lot of teachers recommend where they oftentimes I think think that people are sort of unwilling to learn ghost notes or that they think they're boring um my experience has been that like if you're a sort of especially interested in actually like trying to get good at the instrument oftentimes it's actually the opposite problem which is that you totally go overkill on the ghost notes and like I remember you know the thing the thing that I would do is like I would almost never play like a single skip note. I would almost never play a quiet ghost note that was just like, you know, like I would almost never do that as a ghost note. I always try to like basically do like a, a press roll into the snare for like every um, ghost note that I would play. So like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example um, on the Dream Theater album that we've been playing some songs off of, actually, which is, um, uh, uh, oh, that's really embarrassing. I can't remember what it is. It's the one that, uh, Systematic Chaos, the one that Constant Motion is on. Um, you know, the opener on that is a really long kind of prog epic, you know, 13 minute long thing or whatever. But, you know, the first couple of verses, um, you know, they follow the drum beat is like a very kind of straightforward thing. I mean, the verses are in an odd time signature, but you're kind of really locked in in those verses. You can't mess around too much because it's basically mostly um, the bass and the drums carrying the vocals. Like the arrangement is very sparse. And so you really kind of have to play solidly what the part is. You can't mess around too much. And, um, so even though it's, I think it's an odd time, it's in sort of exchanging measures of seven and six. And I think the, the pattern on the, on the bass is something like, dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun. Something like that. It's it's pretty simple, and then you're kind of holding down all of the empty space there, and kind of matching the you're matching the bass when it plays, and then you're kind of filling in a lot of the excess space when it's silent. And um, you know, there's like you can audibly hear ghost notes on the record, but I like wouldn't play the number of ghost notes that were on the record. I would play like the maximum amount of like basically press rolls. <laughs> in between. So the beat was supposed to sound something like this.
See, I'm trying to play the drum beat, but this cymbal keeps going off in my ears. Wait a second. Oh, it's so annoying. It's so annoying. Um, how do I stop it from doing that? Can I just turn the sensitivity down on it? Uh, yeah, let's try that. There we go. Okay, we're just gonna try that. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Let's just try that. Yeah, the beat is this, I remember it now. So you can hear the ghost notes there. It's the quiet parts on the snare. You know, and, and instead of actually playing it like that, I played, I, I got so addicted to the idea of playing ghost notes that I played something like this. Where it was like, I was trying to like constantly do that in songs. I was like skittering along the surface of this, uh, like I had a brush or something and, and like using terrible technique, like, like, you know, in the first couple of months, uh, you know, the bad habit that I had to break very early on teaching myself was that I got so used to trying to play just the immense amount of buzz rolls and press rolls that I was trying to put on the snare um, in the form of ghost notes that I like basically stopped using anything but my fulcrum because I just wanted the stick to constantly be like bouncing. And it's something that I do even now still where it's like kind of when I come up from the snare, I can sometimes feel myself do something like this, you know? And, and, and that really comes from the fact that I had developed this habit of like, yeah, whenever there wasn't a backbeat, I was trying to fill every bit of empty space with just like an unlimited amount of ghost notes and not even really notes. Like they were not really even in time. They were just sort of like press rolls. So it was a sort of indeterminate, indiscriminate amount of hits that I would actually get. It wasn't something like, um, you know, this where like, you know, there's multiple hits in a row, but it's actually two in a row, right? It's not a press roll where it's just going like or something. No, it's... It's actually two discrete hits. It wasn't something like this. You know, so that that I'm tempting to illustrate there. You know, I'm filling a, a pretty much all of the empty space that's available with with ghost notes in the first part of that measure, but I'm not just like indiscriminately going like. It's not that. It's it's two hits at a time. Da 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 da. You know. Um, and so, yeah, you, you end up with a lot of people who, who I think are trying to play like basic beats or like they try to play the Tom Sawyer beat, which really doesn't have ghost notes in it. And like, you know, I know that I did this where like the beat sounded terrible for a really long time because you try to just add stuff and, and it ends up sounding like this.
you know, because you don't really have the technique down and you're trying to do too much. Whereas, like, you would just do yourself a lot better if you just actually, like, looked at how Neil Peart played it, which is, like, pretty much no ghost notes, right? Like, it sounded a lot better that way. You know, because then you can concentrate on making it groove harder and stuff. And so, a as with everything, there's sort of appropriate and inappropriate times for sort of um, really intensive use of ghost notes. And, you know, there are times where it really does actually sort of fill out the sound of a drum beat in a way that maybe you don't notice, um, but that, that does kind of fill it out. I noticed this... Uh, seeing at the gates play you know that's like a very you know they're very metal you know like there's a lot of sound going on he doesn't necessarily need to play ghost notes but it actually does kind of make things feel better to have the kind of micro time of the snare going on during some of the passages where they transition out of like their fast you know gallop beats and their fast um like thrash beats and stuff like that and then they go into like slow rolling double bass sections his snare, his hand is dancing all over the snare, and it actually does kind of add something. You know, there were a lot of transitions between sections that were like that, where like, yeah, the slow sections with kind of like jogging double bass underneath would have a ton of ghost notes on the snare because the backbeats were really far apart. You know, you would go a full, you know, slow two count before you had to really hit the backbeat, you know, you know, if you're keeping an, uh, uh you know, uh, a pulse on a cymbal there. That really lets you kind of dance around on the snare in the, in the meantime. And it does fill things out, you know. And then there are, of course, other examples of drum beats that sort of, like, use ghost notes in ways that are, like, totally, you know, they, they wouldn't really feel like the same beat otherwise. Um, you know, there's... I know there's that Blink-182 song that has a lot of it. I can't remember exactly how he plays it because he kind of transitions between weird buzz rolls uh, on the hi-hat and the snare. I can't remember quite what it sounds like, but that's one where I think the ghost notes kind of make the beat characteristically what it is. I can't remember what it is exactly, but it's something like this. You know, that little press roll on the snare. You know, that kind of makes that beat in some way. Um, another one is, um, you know, Bleak by Opeth, which I kind of plan on playing today. Um, has another ghost note that's pretty important to the beat. So there's kind of a couple of different versions of it. Some of them make are really f essential to the way that the beat sounds. Other things just basically provide um, the audience with more sort of danceability and more assuredness that the time is actually what they think it is because there's all of these sort of um, signifiers that your brain is taking as like, yeah, these little things that are interspersed and peppered throughout the beat, they are kind of 
conforming to the time that I'm feeling, you know, that the louder parts of the kit are playing and stuff like that, you know? Um, however, what I will say is that uh, what I've noticed is that actually stripping the drums out of songs on the Moises app and playing them that way and also playing on stream and then listening back a little bit. One thing that I have noticed that I must say is that um, they're maybe like less important in a live context than maybe drummers build them up to be when you like, you know, look up, you know, drum lessons about ghost notes and stuff like that. You know, uh, this is something that I think, um, you know, Mike Mangini has talked about being in dream theater is that, you know, with him being in dream theater, he's playing a lot of stages that are like larger and louder and where he has more equipment supporting his drum kit and there are more amps and PAs and stuff like that than he's ever experienced before in a live setting in his life. And what he's noticed, uh, I, I think he's written this somewhere, is that like he basically has to play ghost notes as like almost as strong as his full power notes in order for them to actually be heard out there in the audience. Um, and, and I've noticed this even with streaming. It's like, ghost note patterns that I thought were like really tasty and really groovy oftentimes are just like inaudible. You know, one of the ghost note um, things that I was showing you earlier, one of the beats I was showing you comes out of um, Still Echoes, a Lamb of God song. And when I covered that song for Instagram, I realized that basically I, um, I thought that those ghost notes sounded really cool in that drum beat, but basically when I played them with the track live and then recorded it, I realized that they were basically inaudible. Like you just could not hear them or if anything, they were so indistinct that basically they sounded like, they just contributed to the noisiness of the overall sound chain. You know what I mean? They were almost like a detriment that I was playing them. And so to make them actually work, I actually needed to play them way louder than I was normally comfortable with. It was this beat. You know, those, uh, I think, I think you know, when I actually play them with the track, I try to play them even louder than that, you know, almost like this. And, you know, you can, you know, maybe you can't tell from the camera angle, but, like, in order to play that, I am lifting the stick probably a good four or five inches off of the drum head, you know? And it's, like, when you're, when you're learning, you know, to play, particularly on, like, an acoustic snare, right, rather than, like, an E-kit like this or something, it's, like, you know, people forget, like, drums are so ear-splittingly loud that the way that you kind of learn from a proper instructor is to play them, like, so quietly. But, but that is, that is like, um, you know, that's sort of a good finger control exercise and stuff like that. But the truth is that if you were like playing something live or even going into a recording studio and like really wanted the microphones to actually pick up your ghost notes because they had a fundamental, they were adding a fundamental quality, musical quality to the beat, you actually need to learn to play the ghost notes louder.
you know, and that's like a, that might not seem very extreme, but that was a volume jump of probably about double, you know, the, the, the volume on that. And yeah, I mean, the truth is that um, we're still at a point where it's like microphones are so good now, but even they are not that good. I mean, literally, if you are expecting that, if you're in a live context or if you're recording an album and you have two distorted guitars and a bass and a singer and maybe even a freaking keyboardist or some shit, right? <laughs> the truth is your little baby, <laughs> you know, that, that's just not going to like, you know, if, if, you know, if you're in like a cool prog band and they give you like a fun drum break to play, I mean, that's a different story. If you're solo, all of the other instruments sort of fade out and then you're playing whatever, you know, yeah, you can play stuff at all sorts of different volumes. But as we've discovered on this stream, you know, the sound of a drum kit on its own versus the sound of a drum kit when it gets mixed in with a full band, those two sound profiles seem to sort of change drastically. And so, yeah, you know, if the other instruments fade out and you get eight measures to do your thing, yeah, play stuff at all sorts of different volume levels. You know, like that, something like that would be like a perfectly acceptable drum break in like a prog metal power, power prog band, you know, a power metal prog metal band or whatever, however you would want to say that something like that would be a perfectly acceptable, you know, drum break, but that's not going to be the majority of the time you're playing. The majority of the time you're going to be playing, it's like, yeah, you're competing with like, you know, two guitars that are, you know, going <laughs> and then, you know, a bass that's thumping along with that or might be doing its own thing harmonically, right, which is going to even busy up the, the sound profile of the record even more. And then, yeah, there's a vocalist, there's effects. It's like your little, <laughs> I hate to say, it's like much less important than what Drumeo told you it was going to be, <laughs> right? So for me, it's like... um. You know, Ghost Notes, I've had sort of an interesting history with in that way because it's like I went from overplaying them a lot to then basically having to learn from scratch how to not suck at them to then, you know, kind of recently having had to reevaluate my approach to them where I had gotten them to sound good, but they actually were too quiet. They were too ghostly, uh, you know. So, yeah, I mean, they're... Um, they're an interesting. They're an interesting thing. Now, now, I mean, the other good thing about them is that they're they're sort of especially hard to quantize or make sound um, good if you're faking drums. Um, they sound too robotic or too intentional or something like that if you're just placing all of the ghost notes. You know, there was some Misha Mansoor side project or something like that that was like a sort of intentional ripoff of an Opeth song, and sort of like clearly as as an homage to the drummer, to, to, you know, the drum beat that we were talking about earlier, the Bembe, you know, the guy in this band, you know, which is connected to periphery in some way, right. Which is kind of one of the, the main, uh, you know, progenitors of this surgically precise style of modern metal music. The drummer plays the Bembe pattern, you know, he plays this. And he literally plays it for like a measure or two, just as like an, an a homage, essentially. And um, like it sounds so fake because those ghost notes that are peppered in against the ride symbol, it's really hard to make those sound real if you are locking ghost notes to a grid. Because in some sense, they're always going to be a little bit like a press roll. They're going to be a little sort of zip, a little zing that's very much in your own personal micro time. Very rarely are your ghost notes gonna be like this sort of totally soulless, on the money thing. It's like, no, oftentimes they're there to add a little sauce, you know? <laughs> and, and so that's hard to fake. You can't really fake the sauce. Um, you know, it needs to have a little swagger to it if you're gonna play uh, a beat 
and sit on a beat for many measures that has a lot of ghost notes in it. The best example of how the, the ghost notes really add to the groove is the shuffle beat, of course. little bit of sort of a Rosanna shuffle played for memory there as well as a fool in the rain shuffle played for memory there um, if you wanted to actually play the Rosanna shuffle well what would it be it's it's doom doom booga boom what is it doom booga boom booga boom boo. yeah there's only one like double stroke on the on the bass drum let me try to play it sounding like good The real problem coming out of an especially busy shuffle like that is is not, you can actually lock into the groove and make it feel good. It's really like when you inevitably have to do a fill to get out of it. <laughs> and that's of course the thing in, in the Toto song too, is that um, I think the drum fill to get out of the shuffle that comprises sort of the main part of the song or the first half of the song is 
like a really unconventional weird drum beat that that hits against um these 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 horn section stabs that are like really precise like the horn section just comes in out of nowhere and it's like <laughs> you know and like suddenly you have to come out of you know the uh the the shuffle to hit that and it's yeah i i can't even really remember what it is but it's some not great feeling thing You know, something something like that. Um, yeah. Okay. It's time for me to play something else. We have a lot to get through today, and uh, it's pumpkin spice death metal. So we we have to play some moody. We have to play some moody stuff. Opeth, you know, to open with leper affinity is pretty is pretty moody. But we have some other stuff to do. I, I, uh, I, uh, I also realized. I think I may uh, quickly need to run to the bathroom. I have been like waiting to do this for about 20 minutes now. Give me like 20 seconds. This is one of these other great mysteries of the streaming world is I don't know, how do people navigate that? You know, I've been lucky to not be stricken with the need to do that really very much at all, but I don't know, if, if it happens, how do you deal with it? I just don't know. But I refuse to actually watch a live stream because um, this platform sucks, <laughs> to be honest, and I just don't, I don't have the patience, so I, I refuse to learn. Um, okay. This is a Slayer, classic. Slow Slayer, very rare. But a uh, good spooky song as the days start to get, you know, as uh, the days start to get gray, as the darkness falls over the earth. Oh yeah, this is it.
fucking
I wanted to make up for how much longer I, I talked than I planned on talking by just seeing how long I could go just down the laundry list of stuff to play uh, before I needed a break. <laughs> it's just a lot of... Uh, a lot of hands on that one. Lots of tss, tss, tss for seven minutes at a time. Um, that was good. What 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 the hell did we play? So we played uh, we played South of Heaven by Slayer, and then we played Nightmare, and then we played La Via Strangiato. Once again, fitting with the theme of night, darkness, dreaming, sleep. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, didn't really plan on playing La Via Strangiato this week, but I uh, suddenly sort of got the 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 itch to play it. Um, let's see, um, what was the play-by-play -play there looking like? South of Heaven went pretty well, so of course, you know, yet another thing that was um, <coughs> obviously not recorded to a click. But I love that song, and I've listened to it so many times that I feel like... Um, I've memorized the sort of slowdowns and speed ups, um, usually speed ups. I mean, the song kind of just keeps speeding up progressively throughout the course of the song. Um, you know, the drum fills leading out of it, you can kind of hear because he keeps a relatively steady tempo throughout basically the first couple of them. And then the last um, tempo change, which is the one that sort of transitions you into the verse, is like it like really audibly speeds up. Or no, that's the intro, and that one speeds up a little bit. The last fill in that is something like this. I'll try to audibly speed up the last fill. speeds up almost that much um, if not if not maybe a little more actually and um, then the only the only weird things to remember during that song are the guitar solos are you know this will come as no shocker if you listen to the guitar solos in most layer songs but uh, clearly they were pretty much improvised, um, <laughs> which also means that they go on for kind of a weird length of time. Um, I think the first guitar solo section goes on for basically 12 measures. Uh, it's not like an even 16 or eight or something like that. It goes on for basically three phrases rather than four. And then the last one goes on for about that much, but sort of in the last... Um, measure it transitions into a little sort of like two bar outro dun 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 brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
in the way that they should sound. Um, they did actually come out correct because I think I, you know, this this kind of um, secondary pedal, my um, non-dominant foot uh, double bass pedal, um, it was having some weird kind of w- wacky issues last week. I kind of messed with some stuff earlier in the day today and think I fixed most of the problem. Um, so those, I think, sounded pretty good. Once again, I couldn't hear them in isolation, but I'm going to play them now and see if they actually come out correctly. Because, again, this was like kind of not triggering last week, which would mean that the the fills at the beginning of Nightmare would be like totally screwed. But I think they basically worked. Yeah, it's mostly fixed. And of course, now this is just triggering randomly for no reason, which is fun. Um, yeah, the only two like super fast double bass sections are, of course, those fills. And then kind of the first part of the guitar solo, there's those super quick gallops. Couldn't resist trying to throw a blast beat into that. Um, yeah, I think these pedals are, are pretty much working again. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, yeah, some of that might just be my foot dragging a little. Yeah, yeah, they're good, they're good. Um, yeah, Nightmare was good. Were there any timing problems with that? Not really. Um, the only, the only things with that song to really watch out for, I think, is just actually, weirdly, the part you would think is easiest is just um, not rushing at all in those beginning sections where it's just on the hi-hat with the bass drum underneath. Just because, like, um, with the drums removed from the track, there's not really, like, a timing marker. You just kind of have to have a solid sense of exactly where the quarter note is sitting. Um... I can show you what I mean. It's the part after this. Yeah, like there's a guitar chugging in the background doing 16th notes. But it's all one note. So you just need to stay absolutely on top of the beat uh, there. Um, yeah, that's a fun one. That's a fun one. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll just play that again. Maybe we'll play that again.
I was uh I always just wish that there was some version of that song where they just sat on that chorus um for like four times as long. Like like basically I want I want the Opeth version of Avenged Sevenfold's Nightmare, in which they transition into that chorus and you just sit in that for like measure upon measure with tons of just weird playing around on the ride symbol because that's part of what makes that chorus so characteristic is like I've never seen people at a concert before um um singing a ride symbol part <laughs> but people do it at event sevenfold shows they go and they specifically air drum ding da ding da ding ding da ding da ding and da da ding da ding da ding da ding da ding ding like you actually see people doing that. And I wish that there was a version of that chorus where they just went through a bunch more permutations of it. I mean, that's a little indulgent, obviously, but I still wish it existed. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I need to make it. I'll probably get copyright claimed, though, if I do. Um, hell, I'm going to get copyright claimed just for playing it anyway, so whatever. Uh, and then what was the last thing? What was the last thing I played? Oh, La Via Strangiato. Right. Um... That went pretty well, actually. Um, came out of the came out of the first drum solo like a touch late, um, but it kind of worked, you know. It kind of like I kind of I kind of knew where I was uh, where I was going enough that that I kind of caught back up on it immediately. I think actually, probably the the rest of the song was significantly improved compared to how I played it last time. It was much more relaxed playing that, but, um, yeah, drum solos, I think still sounded pretty good. Um, yeah, so that's, that's committed to memory again. Um, all it took was just kind of reintroducing it into the, 
into the working order of what I was playing. Um, yeah, that was a, a pretty successful run of it, I would say. Um, I kind of just want to play Spirit of Radio again because we played it last week. I know it's sort of against the theme, but I think it would just kind of be fun to try to get it. Um, <clears throat> the thing I noticed about it playing it last week is that, um, and maybe I mentioned this, but I can't, I can't quite remember. Some of the phrases are kind of of a bizarre length in this. So like some things only repeat like three times. Um, but then they'll come back a second time around in the song and they'll repeat a totally different number of times. So there's some sort of interesting kind of arrangement challenges to it that I didn't quite catch last time that I would like to try to catch this time. So let's try Spirit of Radio by Rush again. This close to buying a Roland TD twenty seven. <laughs> oh my god! I and now it's not going to do it because I jiggled the wire a little bit. Here we go. Here we go. Oh my god. Oh, it's so infuriating. Oh my god. Okay, gonna try again. Wow. You know, it's like I I feel I feel so much more comfortable on stream. I feel so much more comfortable playing uh, and putting my playing out there in the world now than when I started doing this. And you know what? It's like to be sabotaged at every turn by these little pieces of rubber <laughs> and plastic. Oh, my God.
That solved most of the problems. Um, you know what is interesting is like part of part of the uh, the interesting thing about that song. Well, not even that song. I mean, really, a lot of a lot of Rush songs is um, the the Neil Peart uh, classic ride cymbal pattern. Uh, Basically, um, if you were to put the snare in it, it would be dun 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 Let me just play it. That. I have it in my head, all of these sort of like live recordings from YouTube that I used to sort of obsess over from like probably a decade ago at this point where um, he really busies up the bass drum pattern a lot and kind of seemingly at random. Like he puts the bass drum in kind of different places and basically what he does to busy it up is he matches the doubles on the ride cymbal to doubles on the feet. So there's three sets of doubles in one of those measures on the ride cymbal because it's dun, 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 dun. Right, dun 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 da dun 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 da dun, dun, and so basically, um, a lot of the live recordings, really one of the only ways that he seems to deviate from the studio recordings because he was such a precise player and a precision-minded player was that he, uh, yeah, he seemed to just sort of at random double up those ride cymbal patterns on the feet, and. Um, uh, <laughs> I think I've gotten it into my head that those uh, those quick double bass things, or not even double bass, he's probably playing it with a single pedal, which is part of why I'm having it sound the way it sounds, is like, I just want to maximize that. Like every time that there's an opportunity to play one of those doubles on my left foot, I go for it. And um, that, of course, is not what, what Neil Peart did. He sort of played it occasionally. <laughs> so, so sometimes the feet in Rush songs for me get a little bit more busy than they probably should be because I'm trying to imitate sort of like live recordings, like an amalgamation of like a dozen different live recordings that I've heard over the course of like a decade or something like that. Um, when probably just playing it more straightforward is actually uh, recommended. So, um, but other than that, other than basically needing to have more discipline with my lead foot, that, uh, that solved most of the, um, uh, ignorance I had of the arrangement last week. I think I, I got to, I understood the arrangement better this, this week. I, I had a good sense of it. Um, let's see what else I have. Like, I have like no commentary to make at the moment. I feel like I, uh. I, um, I've been talking so much on recent streams that I just want to fill these with playing and with music. Um, that's kind of the goal after all. Um, let's see. Now that, now that I've actually fixed my double bass, I can play that Sabaton song I was going to play last week. How about we do that? Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, that is a great song. That uh, may be one of the best openers ever for like a modern metal album, at least. Like it puts you in exactly the right mood to listen to the entirety of Carolus Rex. Like it's such a good, like just sock in the jaw right at the beginning. And again, the reason I wanted to play that last week was... <laughs> Uh, again, to me, that is so much harder. I mean, you could probably see the physical exhaustion <laughs> on my face about halfway through that song. I mean, it is so. If if it was if it was like twenty BPM faster, it it would be easier to play. And like literally, I'm I'm gonna have to sit here and talk for a minute because I'm like getting the <laughs> I'm getting the feeling back. <laughs> in my in my like ankles um like the technique for double bass at that tempo is just so totally different and i i feel like i've spent so long working on getting consistent fast speed that that tempo is actually not really where i'm totally comfortable anymore um like again something that's closer to like 180 or faster is like actually kind of where I feel like my wheelhouse is at this point. Something that's more like this, I, I think, is about the right tempo. And of course, playing all of this would be a lot easier if this wasn't just jangling around in the background. <laughs> wow. I kind of thought that I had fixed this, and it's come back with a vengeance. Um, wow. Crazy. Can I do anything to make that stop doing that? It seems to have fixed, it, fixed itself. It'll probably last for the next 20 seconds or so, so that's good. Um, yeah, that that is a wonderful song. Um, as, uh, someone, as someone of a somewhat Catholic persuasion myself, I cannot endorse the line about how uh, Gustavus Adolphus in, in the Swedish Empire made the Catholics shiver and shake. But... <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It's a story about Sweden, so it's fine. And they kind of lose in the end, you know? So it's kind of fine. Um, now, yeah, that that's like an almost perfect album, I think. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's a... It's a great album. It's a great headphones album, too. You know, there are certain bands like this where they've really, like, kind of catapulted into the mainstream... And yet, occasionally, they still come out with an album that is like a perfect, like, sit in the dark with headphones on and just listen to the whole thing and get swept up in it album. You know, which you kind of you kind of think a lot of bands that reach a certain level of popularity stop making music that's sort of worthy of that kind of attention. But there's a couple albums. Again, he's come up before, but 
the great original um, editor in chief of the Invisible Oranges blog, uh, Cosmo Lee, wrote this about one of Amana Marth's albums. Was that like, um, he was like, yeah, I, I kind of thought Amana Marth just did like Walmart metal, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, they they've made a great headphones album, which is like a great indication of of quality, as far as I can tell. If you can really just sit and close your eyes and dedicate an hour of your time to just like listening to something with headphones on, you know, you can't really get up and walk around. The music is right there in your ears and you can just sit there enraptured by it, you know, and that album is like that. Um, Careless Rex by Sabaton is like that. And um, I think that's a very underrated opener as well. I know other people talk about other songs on that album. Um, I know people, uh, they talk about the, the title tra track most often. They talk about Carolus Rex, which is, of course, yeah, this giant, like, epic. Um, this epic. And then, and then um, I, uh, people also talk about, what is it? Um, um, dun, 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 dun. Poltava. I feel like I hear people talk about the song Poltava a lot, um, but no, that's a that that opener. I think is just the perfect mood setter. The Nightfly, perfect for headphones. Yes, the Nightfly, a beautiful a beautiful headphones album. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> It can't run on the new frontier. There'll be spandex jackets, one for everyone. What a beautiful world it will be. Get your tickets to that wheel in space while there's time. <laughs> the fix is in. Um, oh man, um, and of course it's yeah, it's got those it's got those amazing Donald Fagan, you know, the Steely Dan lyrics that are like sort of weird, like postmodern poetry that are like kind of funny and don't quite make sense, but they're very they're very evocative. The imagery is very strong. And then, yeah, of course, the, the production of the whole thing is just so immaculate anyway. I know that that's supposed to be one of those, it's supposed to be one of the tester albums, you know, where, you know, if, if the Nightfly sounds really crisp and wonderful on your sound system, you know that you've set up your sound rig correctly. Um, oh, yeah, what a beautiful album and, like, just amazing playing. I'm sure, I'm sure just, a, just a horde of studio musicians, you know, but that that was kind of you know the Steely Dan thing as well. It's like the number of people in the in the the track credits on those albums is just like off the off the wall. The number of people playing on any given track. So yeah, oh beautiful album, beautiful album. Yeah, I don't know that there's like a metal version of Nightfly in that way. Something that is sort of canonically considered to be.
canonically considered to be like one of the great albums or something like that. Um, in 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 that you know every song is perfect and the sound is perfect. You know what I mean? Like, in some ways, Blackwater Park by Opeth might be that by sort of like the modern standards for metal music. Um, although the funny thing is, I think you find you find. Um, dissent from that view pretty frequently i mean i'm i'm one of the people who thinks that unequivocally their best album is still life uh which precedes precedes blackwater park it's the one before blackwater park um so yeah i mean i don't know that there's something that has hit that level of like the gold standard in that way um yeah let's see here okay We've been we've been going for ages here. Um, God, I keep wanting to watch this Matt Garska video on stream, and then I keep I keep like getting wrapped up in other stuff and doing other stuff instead. Um, God. Okay, here's here's what we'll do. Here's what we'll do. But now I'm in a good mood. Now, I, now I'm in a good mood. I don't know that I want to play something super dark. Uh, hmm, that's a dilemma. What could I, what could I do here? Yeah, you know what? You know what? Let's. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. So many options. You know, let's play something that that maybe feels a little bit more positive. This is a, uh, I haven't played this in forever, but I love this song. This is a uh, this is Soil Work, uh, the great melodic extreme metal band. Um, this is, a, this is a lovely song. This is a very lovely song. Uh, and it's not it's not too, like, grim sounding. So this is a good way. We were supposed to have a grim stream. We were supposed to have Pumpkin Spice Death Metal today, but it's more like Pumpkin Spice, you know, prog now. But that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's fine. I'm in a good mood, man. I don't want to... I want to keep the good times going. So how about we... I'm going to play this, and then I'm going to shut up, and then... Or I'm going to shut up, I'm going to play this, and then I'm going to stop shutting up, and I'm going to commence talking about this Matt Garska video, and then I'm going to be done. How about that? Okay.
I kind of want to play that again and get that totally right. <laughs> um, I actually might do that. See, that was around the time, as you can hear, that was the time, around the time that Moises, like, changed its rules about what links you were allowed to upload. So I had to, like, rip it from, like, a lyric video on YouTube or something like that. So it still has a weird, like, preview of a so of the song again at the end. That, uh, that was, that was, I'm mostly, mostly happy with that. Again, 
the funny thing about this is you don't realize how distracting something like this symbol just going off at random actually is until you're like trying to keep time coming out of a part that's like particularly chaotic where like you really need to hear the guitar and then this thing is just going <laughs> off in the background that's so that is so obnoxious okay um okay here's what i here's what i wanted to do this is i i have wanted to do this for probably the past four or five episodes of this i have had this video up mostly as a way to both celebrate the brilliance of Matt Garstka, but also to talk about the ways in which, as we've discussed, Matt Garska is also clearly a product of a kind of confused, um, digitally native culture. Um, because... As far as I can gather, this is like he must have live streamed or something, and this is a clip from a live stream, and he's playing along to just like an Aesop Rock random ass hip hop track or something. I don't know anything about like I haven't. I don't think I've like regularly listened to a hip hop album that that came out post like two thousand nine. Uh, you know, ever <laughs> basically. So I know nothing about this. It, this is less about the song or anything, and more just about the playing on display, right? He's, he's covering a song and what he's doing is maybe slightly different from what I'm doing, right? Which is that I'm trying to emulate a great drummer, uh, when I'm, when I'm playing a part and that's not what he's doing. He is a great drummer. And so basically what he's doing is he's taking a song that has a very sparse percussion part and basically taking creative license to play something interesting over top of it. Um, a lot of what he's playing is like very complicated, but if you can make sense of it, just try to listen to what he's playing and, and how he's playing it. And, and I want to just talk about it. Love note to the whole fuck show Postmarked from a lighthouse in a blood smoke Dear motherfuckers, I'm teetering if you must know Wolf at the door like a bug to the fructose Niece on the phone saying Ian you should visit more We can build forts but a big sport civil war Miss you, miss you more, see you on the far side Scuffed shoes, couple new scars in the archive I'm not here to pull scars out Here to pick tumblers underwater with his arms bound from in chains to the heart of where art thou? I'm out there, down the road, rap, now let a guard tower. Down a spray piss on a cop car. It's rage in the form of Renaissance art. Can't treat it like a job at the stockyard. And being shot when they try to block to a pockmark. Stock parts knocking on my quad, I can't blow. Amped up, eyes glowing, unknown, pants on. So, so already you could see part of, part of you know, what the, what the deal here is, right? Which is that what he's playing is like, brilliant and and off the wall and insane and he's you know kind of you know if you're if you're not like used to listening to songs for rhythm you know what it sounds like wow water just sprayed me in the face wow um what it sounds like is that um he's sort of slipping in and out of time or something like that. But if you listen to the confidence with which the notes are being played, you look at his body language and also you listen to just the sound of the percussion and, and the level of um, purposefulness with, with, with which the notes sound like they're landing. Even if you're like a non-percussionist and you can't really decipher at all what's going on. Um, it's, it's, clear even though it sounds like it that he's not actually slipping in and out of time he knows exactly where his notes are landing he's like metrically modulating all over the place i'm pretty sure um like the flow in this song like literally where the syllables of aesop rock's verse here is landing these are eighth notes so you can already tell how strange it is because like this is your pulse. It's like one, two, three, four, da 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 da. 
da 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 right like all of the all of the flow is like something like this and i'm pretty sure that's where the <clears throat> that's where the the kind of implied time is throughout the whole song as far as i can tell and and like has he played something that actually feels like it's sticking to this time at all thus far i mean just listen like there's nothing that even feels like it's in that even ballpark of this grid, right? Just listen. Like he's doing all of these things, you know, the implied, the implied accents are like, bah, 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 you know, like the, you know, and that's as close as you get to like, da, 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 da. and even that, I think he's playing like a weird, like five lit or something like that, <laughs> you know, um, and, and okay. So, so you get the gist of what he's doing here, which is that he's basically mocking over top of essentially the ostinato of the track, right? Um, in a way that's like really impressive, right? And, um, just, just, uh, again, here's how I wanted to put this. We're going to just keep listening to this. I'm going to like shut up for a minute and let it just play here. Listen for when we actually get to this. Right. This being the pulse of the song. Wait until, listen to how long it takes to get there. We're almost there here, but he keeps throwing kind of interesting polyrhythms over. But we kind of get this hi hat pattern, ta, 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 ta. so we're pretty much there. But he keeps coming, slipping back out of it intentionally. So, you know, it's a it's a th song that's a little bit over three minutes long. And and how long did it take until we actually got to? I think that uh, the count was something like two minutes and fourteen seconds. Right, that's how long it took until we got to just that nice feeling groove. And so my point here is not to do. The sort of like boomer thing, which is to say like, where's the soul? Where's the groove? Right? <laughs> I understand that what he's doing is he is on a Twitch stream, right? And he is showing off for an audience of people to a certain degree. That's part of what's going on in a video like that, right? Um... It would be pointless to just sit and play something boring, 
right? I, I could sit here and try to really tastefully work on my groove for three hours once a week. And what that would mean is that I wouldn't talk at all. I would play very few songs or no songs, or I would play a looping backing track. And I could sit here and work on my groove for three hours a week, every week. And it would sound like this. And I could, I could do that for two hours at a time, right? And in fact, I should probably do more of that in my private practice time, right? Um, practicing just playing like that would be phenomenally helpful to my time, particularly if I just played grooves like that at a variety of different tempos with the metronome on. And then once I got comfortable with certain grooves at certain tempos with the metronome on, I could put the metronome on off beats. So instead of being one, two, three, four, uh, you know, the metronome could be on like one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and, right? And then one Iana, two Iana, three Iana, four Iana, <laughs> right? I could get all sorts of crazy with it. I mean, this is, again, part of the point of the books that I'm using is I'm trying to use the books in order to practice like that. That's rhythmic illusions, right? Is basically metronome displacement and stuff like that. And, and I could come on here and I could do that, right? And who would think that that was fun? No one would think that was fun. And I certainly wouldn't think that that was fun right? Part of the reason that I'm, you know, turning this into, uh, the reason that I give it episode numbers, as if it's a television show, the reason I plan on having these long seasons as if it's like a soap opera or something, right, where it actually is structured like a show, we're not just with episodes, but with seasons, the reason that I put effort into the descriptions on the YouTube channel, right, the reason that I have tried to set up a backdrop for the drums. The reason I have this microphone and not a different microphone, uh, you know, all of these things are in order to make it feel like a program, to make it feel like a piece of programming, to elevate it above the level of content, 
right? <laughs> to try to give it some flair. And part of that is I want to play flashy, fun, fast, difficult songs live so that there's some danger to this. Like I can actually mess up. And if you watch this stream, you see me make mistakes constantly, right? And, and so that's what Matt Garsk is doing. Matt Garska is in his own way as a sort of galaxy brain legend who's basically a master of the instrument. He is doing something that is fun. He's on a Twitch stream, right? I don't, ex I don't wanna do this boomer thing of like, there's no feel, where's the feel? He should just play good straight time, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I, I understand that this is not really the audience or the time for this. He's on a Twitch stream. He wants to pull out, you know, he wants to pull out, frankly, you know, shit like, I mean, I can probably just go to a random part of the video and find stuff. He wants to pull out shit like, you know, this. If it plays. Smoke and mirrors, wish you do a med kit and spare clothes. Leave a motherfucker no fair clothes. New superpower that I picked up in a frenzy. I could draw a roof on fire from memory. Each and every sketch and other bloodletting. In the wake of escalation and excessive rubber necking. The team can't look away, drink it in. He wants to pull out shit like that. Wait. Bloodletting. In the wake of escalation and excessive rubber necking. You know, just like weird, crazy shit that just like absolutely blows people away, right? That's the audience. And you know what? I like totally respect that, you know? Um, but what, I, what, I, what I'm saying is, is not that there's no value to that or that there's nothing impressive going on there. Um, what I'm, what I'm simply saying is that there's kind of an interesting thing that appears if you just analyze that as being, um, you know, if you don't, again, trying to not do the boomer thing of being like, well, I don't like this because I can't tell what's going on or whatever, right? N no, it's like there's something very impressive going on there. And, you know, I'm experienced enough at this instrument that I think I can basically decipher what a lot of it is. I mean, I think, I think it, in essence, if you were to break it down, a lot of what's happening there is essentially that... Um, there's basically combinations of a couple of things. He's cutting into straightforward time a lot, actually, right? Where he's not metrically modulating or doing something crazy, but he almost never just plays the tempo of the song until, once again, you reach that two and a half minute mark or whatever. You know, he's very rarely playing like... You know, stuff like that where it's like you can tell that the time is like dun da 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 He actually does play straight time, but instead of playing something where it's like, hey, this is the time, when he cuts into the normal time of the song, he plays a lot of these phrases like da 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 which is actually still the same as this. It's just that the it, it feels different. It's the same time though, right? Dun dun da, dun 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 dun. This is the same time as this. Dun, da, 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 da. Because it's the same pulse. Ta 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 ta. Right. And so he's actually not playing some sort of super crazy metrically modulated thing throughout the majority of the thing. He's using that feel, bum, ba dum, bum, ba dum, bum, this kind of gospel feel thing or whatever, um, as a basis to then add in the occasional weird thing that's out of time. And a lot of the things that are out of time are simply actually not that mind blowing stuff. Like you can figure out what it is mathematically, right? There's a lot of displaced triplets, right? Um, and then there's a lot of weird, I think, basically stuff in fives, right? So it's like, um, you know, taking the first part of that, 
um, that slowed down measure. Bum, 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 bum. It's kind of in, you know, phrases of three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Something that he's doing, I think, to add some sort of modularity and madness to the equation is so yeah there's kind of offset triplets and then so one of the things that he'll do is he'll take the three of those phrases one two three one two three one two and he'll fit in a five lit so five evenly spaced notes instead of three so it'll go from one two three one two three one two to basically like one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two. Right. And and that's a very odd measure to pick because our ears are used to hearing you sort of either play that straight or to kind of maybe tumble down it as either eighth notes or triplets, right? You know, things like those eighth notes or those triplets are much more sort of frequently heard applications of time when you have a long phrase like that. And instead, he's, I think, doing things where he's putting in a lot of like fives and sevens into those big, washy, open passages, right? And so basically, you can sort of layer those on top of one another in a way in which they kind of become their own time signature if you basically imply a backbeat on certain ones of those. So if, you, if you're going from one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, to something where you're going like one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two. If you were to put, you know, let's say a snare on the threes of those, it kind of becomes its own meter for a second that sounds internally coherent even though it's kind of grading against the music in the background. You know, so that's a kind of, that's a rudimentary way of explaining what what I think is going on through a lot of the song. So it's basically, sorry, I need to turn around again. It's, it's basically a lot of sort of like the skeleton of this big, washy, 4-4 four, four gospel thing that actually is in time and sort of matches more closely with the feel of the song that basically is used as a skeleton on top of which all of these kind of weird modulations get placed, which basically make things 
get really complicated and strange. And so it, even things were like, he'll do a fill at the start and it'll be sort of like metal style quad fills, like hand, hand, foot, hand, hand, foot. But it'll be played in triplets, which means that basically because it's a group of three, it actually becomes like nine lits, right? So even that is kind of like a way to make it kind of complicated and strange and sort of off kilter sounding. So basically, he's using a lot of sort of tools of the trade to sort of keep your mind active and wandering and constantly hearing new implied meters and new implied time against the background of this solid track that he can kind of, in a really satisfying way at that two and a half minute mark, punch back into normal time at basically any second. And it turns into like suddenly it all integrates and locks in together in this very satisfying way because he sort of intentionally brought you very far afield. And so when he goes back into sort of common time, it feels very satisfying, right? Uh, all that I will say is that like, you know, again, you can tell by the way I'm talking about this, I am not sort of like doing the boomer thing of like, where is your feel? Where's your soul, right? <laughs> you know? You know, you should go like play the blues or something like that to get more to get more feel. I'm not saying that like no one on the, on the planet has anything to teach Matt Garska in some way. You know what I mean? He's like clearly a master. All that I'm saying is that I think the type of playing that you're seeing and then the way in which it's being played is telling of a kind of shift culturally in terms of how people think of like virtuosity on a musical instrument because you know, where a sort of heritage class drummer, a guy like Vinnie Colyuda, would have played something, Matt Garska basically plays it the opposite. Um, and what, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that, you know, Vinnie Colyuda, if he was just in a circumstance where he was told to just be impressive, to just blast over something, right? What would he do? He would probably kind of like take you on a journey, Right? And so he would actually probably start just straight up playing the song in normal time. And then slowly but surely, he would add in variations, right? Like a guy like Vinnie Colyuda would basically start here. Like, like this would be the beginning of him playing the song. Right, which is basically like you have a really solid, tasty groove that you then occasionally add embellishment to and stuff like that, right? Um, and, then, and then he would get slowly more and more crazy and it would probably reach an apex and then he would probably very quickly drop it back down and bring you back to the normal time and it would feel really satisfying, right? It would really be like narratively structured in that way. What I think is very telling is that like Instagram appears to have fully sort of like consumed the mind of the typical virtuoso at this point and that they just clearly spend all of their time on social media because that is not what he does. He, he, his, his whole essence is like now primed for like um, engagement farming because what does he do? He starts with crazy shit and then it almost doesn't even climax right it doesn't build to a crescendo even really it's just two minutes of like total insanity and then suddenly he like whacks you in the face with just the straight time groove right like he he begins with the crazy part right fuck show postmarked from a lighthouse in a blunt smoke dear motherfuckers i'm teetering like if you even the fills he does at the start are like, like a bug to the fructose yeah they're like weird. He starts out with the crazy shit. 
pick tumblers underwater with his arms bound. Already but messing with feel. And like he just sits in that and there's almost not even a, a climax to it. It just stays crazy for two minutes. And then he, you know, once basically engagement time is over, right, right, he basically cuts to the normal groove. And, and so to me, it's just like, I don't want to see the talent of someone like Matt Garska, right, who is like arguably the greatest living person on the instrument. I don't really like think it's worth his time to just like spend his time catering to like the kind of average intelligence of the person who tends to like want to see a drummer do something crazy, right? <laughs> like not to put too fine a point on it, but in some ways it's like, um, you know, you spend all of your time on Instagram or whatever. It's like you eventually have to sort of end up serving an audience and like the audience of people on these social media sites is just a horde of people, a horde of non-musicians, a horde of, you know, accountants and HR managers and, you know, office floaters and stuff like that, who uh, uh, their only source of joy in their life is their lunch break when they get to like look at Instagram. And so basically, if you like get into people's feeds, you need to just play the least musical flashiest shit possible, right? And, and eventually you reach a point where like you cater your skill set to match that. And the truth is that like, you know, uh, there's just a difference in ethos there, which is that now, now the players hit you right up front. They sock you in the jaw with their crazy metric modulation thing. Or yeah, their crazy sort of like self-made hybrid rudiment patterns played across all four limbs on the kit or something like that. You know, and, and, and part of the issue here is, again, like, the culture of flashiness really gets to people, you know? It's like, if you talk, and I know this because I'm, I'm a very, very terrible jazz musician, you know, as confirmed today when I tried to, like, play a little bit of, like, Latin jazz or whatever at the start of the stream, but it's like, I'm, like, a terrible jazz player, and so I like to, like, try to talk to people who are really good at jazz, right, just to just to develop the background and the worldview to understand how people get good at it. And, like, one of the things they constantly say is, like, and I think I've maybe even said this before on stream, is, like, you talk to any jazz drummer long enough, and what they'll tell you is, like, you know, uh, kids, when they start to play and they start to get any form of chops, they start to treat the classic jazz ride cymbal pattern, the skip beat, da, 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 dun, 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 they start to kind of treat it as just like an ostinato that their one hand is comfortable with and then the rest of their three limbs can kind of um, do sort of weird um, linear patterns around this. And you talk to like jazz drummers for long enough and basically they all end up saying some variation of, of what, you know, Dave King has, has, has said of a recurring character on the show. Dave King has said about this, which is that like, you know, you can almost sort of feel when a lot of guys who like have chops, but maybe don't necessarily have a lot of experience making music start to pull out their, um, their shit that they've been working on and shedding really hard because basically you can physically hear that basically the life comes out of the skip beat pattern. It stops having any bounce or fluidity or vibrancy to it. And basically you can feel him or her lock into this pattern that he's worked on for 20 hours or something like that um, for eight measures or something like that, where now for eight bars, here's, you know, this totally lifeless skip beat that has no time feel to it whatsoever. And, you know, the remainder three limbs are going to do... Right? You know, and it's like, oh, he's really, like, worked on making the weird coordination of those other three limbs work all the while 
yeah, like you have this kind of dead skip beat going dun da da dun da da dun da da dun da da dun over top of that whole thing. Um, that that yeah, it it has no it has no personality to it anymore. And and you know, you talk to any jazz guy for long enough, and they all say that, which is like. You know, you really need to treat in the same way that like in rock music, you need to treat the backbeat as kind of a sacred thing where like really like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, like that feel needs to be so solid for you to become a good rock player. And that means learning how to hit your snare consistently. It means learning how to mix the volume of your hi-hat by not just wailing into it so hard and learning to balance it against the volume level of your bass drum and your snare and stuff like that, right? In the same way, you know, in jazz, the foundation of all the time is that skip beat and learning to just make that feel good. You know, there's all these story, stories about Tony Williams where he would practice, he, he got rid of the rest of the drum kit and he would just sit in a drum throne and he would put a ride cymbal on a stand and he would point the ride cymbal at him and he would just sit there with a metronome on and he would just hit quarter notes on a ride cymbal. It's like, that's like the foundation of jazz time is like make that, make the quarter note on a ride cymbal feel good as hell and then you can move on from there, right? That's like what all of the most experienced jazz players, if you talk to them long enough, will say is like the most important thing to have. And and then like, you know, you see, <laughs> you can find these old videos of Matt Garska and it's like, what is like one of the first things that he says? He says like, oh, I'm like a terrible, you know, I'm like a, I really, I, I have a ton to learn. Like he's being kind of, uh, you know, false humble. And he's like, no, 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 I have a ton to learn. And then they're like, well, what do you think you could actually improve on? And then he says like, ah, I can't play jazz very well. I don't sound very good. And and then they're like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? And then what do you like about it? He's just like, ah, you need to really have a feel for jazz. And I really don't think I have it. And, uh, you know, the thing I really admire about a lot of jazz playing, again, you know, if you're someone like me where, like, you can't play jazz and you admire jazz, the thing you should admire is just the fluidity of the time, right? <laughs> and that stuff. And literally what he says is exactly what we've just been talking about. He goes... It, he literally says the cliche of what a guy who has a lot of chops but doesn't have the feel for jazz says, which is he says, like, I think it's really cool how jazz players can, like, keep that skip beat ostinato going, and then they're doing, like, total four-way independence with all of the other limbs, and they, like, solo with that, where they keep that ostinato going, and I'm, like, not very good at that. I like to have... You know, I kind of like to recruit all of my limbs for a pattern and stuff like that. So that that idea is really cool to me of like keeping one ostinato going. And it's like, oh, this is literally like the stereotype of like what a guy who has chops does. Right. <laughs> right. And in a way, it's like, again, that's not his fault. It's like, yeah, he went to Berkeley and stuff like that. But it's like, you know, Berkeley is Berkeley churning out the next generation of of great like jazz musicians. Is it going to be, you know. Is Eastman School of Music going to be producing another, like, Gad or something like that? Is it going to be producing another person with, like, just amazing time feel or uh, something like that? Or or is it basically a school to train people 24-7 how to play Instagram chops? <laughs> right? And, and the truth of the matter is, I think the evidence points to these are now institutions that teach you how to play Instagram chops. Um, and, and what that means for the future of the instrument, what that means for the future of like progressive music or the future for jazz or prog rock specifically. I don't know. I don't know, you know, in the same way that like, you know, Berkeley kind of gained reputation because four guys, you know, or five guys from, you know, from that school dropped out to form Dream Theater, right? I think in some ways it's like, you know, you see Matt Garcia going to Berkeley and, you know, it's like, you're like, oh, that's the drummer, that's the guy in Animals as Leaders. And so it's like, oh, he's like the Berkeley guy. And it's like, if people are taking inspiration from the way that he plays on Animals as Leaders, man, that will be like a generation of very kick-ass players. But if 
they're not really listening to animals as leaders very much. And they're just like, wow, that's mind blowing. I can't even like understand that. And then they're not trying to decipher the animals as leader songs, but they like the band. So then they follow Matt Garska on Instagram and then they see stuff like this, right? It's like, what are they going to want to learn how to do? They're not going to like want to learn like, Sorry to say, they're not going to have any interest in, like, the thing that I was talking about earlier. Like, I'm going to look like such an old man. It's like, I'm like, yeah, isn't it kind of cool? Like, you know, you can make the paradiddle into, like, a very groovy drum beat, you know? Oh, you know. You know, it's like my focus that I have on myself, which is just if I'm in a performance context and not a practice context, I want to make sure that I'm generally practicing things that I feel like I'm good at playing and that I can make sound good. I just feel like that's like out the window. It's like, no, like I want to I want to really badly try to imitate Matt Garska because his he blows my mind or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong, but. You know, it just seems to me that there's a lot of, it seems to me that there's a lot of like stories that you can find of how, yeah, people now can like come into their like, you know, drum lessons at like, you know, the freaking local Sam Ash or something like that. And they can literally like metrically modulate, you know, um, you know, 30 second note triplets or something like that but they like don't know what like a press roll is or something like that you know so like stories like this i think dave elich is the main guy who tends to like post a lot of screenshots of people like sharing those kinds of stories you know his instagram page is filled with examples of people being like yeah this kid can like um you know he uh he learned the drum solo that Matt Garska played in a live recording from 2015. <laughs> but uh, he didn't know what, like, um, you know, uh, he didn't know what, like, a pataflafla was. <laughs> right? Right? It's like, there's stuff like that where it's like, again, people are learning kind of like what we were talking about earlier. They're memorizing sort of mathematical formulas or they're memorizing chops or, and stuff like that. And they're not necessarily memorizing like discrete musical phrases that can be applied in a diverse variety of contexts, you know? And it's like, maybe the next generation of guitarists will be really fond of that, right? Because they want kind of a Pro Tools drummer who can play like crazy chops or whatever and have them sound pretty good. And by all accounts, I'm sure a lot of people who are young and have poured over, you know, Matt Garska and stuff like that, I'm sure they can like imitate a lot of those chops node for node, like basically perfectly, you know, in a way that I probably will never be able to. But, you know, my, my goal is like, there's a whole history to this instrument at this point, right? There's a history of over a century of, of, you know, people playing this instrument at this point in this form, you know, or something like it, you know, it's long, it's, it's an old enough art form that it actually has a legacy and the legacy extends before, you know, the creation of Instagram, right? <laughs> right. And so there's a lot more to learn from, from there. And yeah, eventually I would like to, not just be pretty good at metal, I would like to also like, yeah, be like passably good at like some of these Latin patterns that we were talking about earlier and stuff like that. I would like to be able to play jazz standards convincingly well, you know? But um, I just I just don't know that, when, when you see that like even the creators of virtuoso level material are themselves, um, kind of burdened by an incentive structure that means that they are producing a lot of stuff very quickly and that they need to hit people up front with stuff instead of building anticipation and bringing people on a journey it doesn't make me like especially hopeful <laughs> you know you know what i mean 
Um, yeah, God, I have gone on for so long here. Um, I'm just going to play something and then be done for the night, I think, uh, and just sign off. So this will be the last time I talk to you. So have a good night. We're going to head out on a song here. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, you know, you'll hear it in a minute here. Thanks for joining. Have a good night. Enjoy whatever this is that I'm about to play.